No problem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good. You good? Yeah. Yeah. I'll be wide for about 10 seconds. Okay. We should not crawl. We should not crawl through the weeds. Yeah. That we know nothing about. <laughs> I think if we'd have done that nowadays, it'd been a different outcome. I think so. <laughs> we'd be full of bullet holes. <laughs> well, we would. Yes. <laughs> At least it would have been air conditioned. Roll out. Yes. That's my case. Put it wherever you want.
sound check, sound check. Can you hear me back there? Is that coming clear? Great, wonderful. Thank you. Good afternoon. Let me start by reiterating that I'm pleased that the New York prosecution is going forward. They brought these charges based on new evidence against Jeffrey Epstein, who is now a registered sex offender. And this is a very, very good thing. His acts are despicable, and the New York prosecution offers an important opportunity to more fully bring Epstein to justice. In 2008, a major newspaper described the Epstein prosecution like this. A Florida grand jury, that is, a grand jury convened by the district attorney of Palm Beach County, had charged Epstein with a lesser offense. At that time, the Epstein legal team was elated. He would have avoided prison altogether. But then the United States Attorney's Office in Miami became involved. Epstein got an ultimatum, plead guilty to a charge that would require jail time and registration or face federal charges. And that was the week more than 10 years ago that Epstein went to jail. Times have changed, and coverage of this case has certainly changed since that article. Facts are important, and facts are being overlooked. This matter started as a state matter. It was prosecuted initially by the state of Florida and not by the U.S. Attorney's Office. In 2006, a grand jury convened by the state attorney, the district attorney of Palm Beach County, reviewed the evidence and recommended a single charge. And that charge would have resulted in no jail time at all, no registration as a sexual offender, and no restitution to the victim. Further, the state attorney's office allowed Epstein to self-surrender and arraigned him the following morning. Simply put, the Palm Beach State Attorney's Office was ready to let Epstein walk free, no jail time, nothing. Prosecutors in my former office found this to be completely unacceptable, and they became involved. Our office became involved. Our prosecutors, as this 2008 article recounts, presented the ultimatum plead guilty to more serious charges, charges that require jail time, registration, and restitution, or we'd roll the dice and bring a federal indictment. Without the work of our prosecutors, Epstein would have gotten away with just that state charge. Now, many today question the terms of that ultimatum, what's called the non-prosecution agreement. A good prosecutor will tell you that these cases are complex, especially when they involve children, and even more so in 2006. I've shared with those in this room today and will make available publicly an affidavit filed by the career prosecutor in a civil matter related to the Epstein case. She talks about the challenges faced. She talks about the victims being scared and traumatized refusing to testify, and how some victims actually exonerated Epstein. 
most had significant concerns about their identities being revealed. The acts that they had faced were horrible, and they didn't want people to know about them. And she goes on to write that, quote, after the fact, people alleged that Epstein would have been easily convicted. As the prosecutor who handled the investigation, she says in this affidavit, these contentions overlooked the facts that existed at the time. Her description of these facts are corroborated by the FBI case agent whose affidavit I've also shared today. Thousands of prosecutors around the nation this week are weighing guilty pleas versus trials. These cases, as I said, are hard. They require a prosecutor to ask whether a plea that guarantees jail time and guarantees registration to ask whether that plea versus going to trial, how do you weigh those two if going to trial is viewed as the roll of a dice? The goal here was straightforward. Put Epstein behind bars, ensured he registered as a sexual offender, provide victims with the means to seek restitution, and protect the public by putting them on notice that a sexual predator was in their midst. This case, people have said, was unusual. And it was. It was complicated by the fact that this matter started as a state investigation. A state grand jury brought that single, completely unacceptable charge. A state official allowed Epstein to self-surrender. And so it is unusual because it's unusual for a federal prosecutor to intervene in a state matter such as this. We've seen cases recently, different set of facts, different. I don't want anyone to say I'm comparing these cases, but we've seen other cases where state prosecutors let folks go with no sentence and people shake their heads. In this case, the federal office intervened before the plea was taken and said, stop, because if that plea is taken at the state level, you're going to face serious federal issues. Today we know a lot more about how victims' trauma impacts their testimony, and this too is important. Our juries are more accepting of contradictory statements, understanding that trauma-impacted memories work differently. And today, our judges do not allow victim shaming by defense attorneys. I have viewed the victim interviews. They're hard to watch because I know that my former colleagues, the men and women of my office, wanted to help them. I wanted to help them. That is why we intervened. And that's what the prosecutors of my office did. They insisted that he go to jail and put the world on notice that he was and is a sexual predator. Epstein's actions absolutely deserve a stiffer sentence. For years, there have been rumors of investigations in other jurisdictions. And he should be prosecuted in any state in which he committed a crime. If there are other states in which he committed crimes, if there are other states that can bring state charges, they should consider those as well. And so I absolutely welcome this New York prosecution. It is the absolutely right thing to do, and I'm happy to take questions. Eric. Eric Morath. How would you describe uh, your relationship with the president the news of the cycle here with Epstein is changing that. Um, my relationship with the president is outstanding. Uh, he has, I think, very publicly um, made clear that, that I've got his support. He spoke yesterday in the Oval Office. He and I have spoken. Um, let me add, I, uh, I keep reading about articles uh, about my relationship with me and Mr. Mulvaney. And uh, he called me this morning to say, if, if asked, that our relationship is excellent too and that 
any articles to the contrary are, in his words, BS. Um, and, uh, and so it's, I'm here. I'm defending this case. That's my job. Tom. Tom. Tom, Tom Yamas, ABC News. Secretary, a lot of people are watching this news conference, including several young women who say they were teenagers when Jeffrey Epstein sexually assaulted them. They say they went to you looking for help, and they didn't hear back from you until it was too late. Do you owe them an apology? So you're raising the issue of victim notification. And um, in the documents that I've circulated, I've addressed the issue of victim notification as well. The career prosecutor in this case had a difficult decision to make. And she didn't make it alone. She made it in consultation with the FBI, and she made it in consultation with the office. The agreement that had been negotiated had an unusual provision. Even though this was a state case, the victims would have the opportunity to receive restitution. Epstein would be required to pay for them to hire a lawyer to bring a case against him, a case in which he would have to plead no contest and provide them with restitution. And the concern, and th these are the words of the career prosecutor, that, quote, she did not want to share with the victims that the office was attempting to secure for them the ability to obtain monetary compensation because she is aware that if she disclosed that and the negotiations fell through, Epstein's counsel would use this to question the victim's credibility. And her concerns were not hypothetical. What if Epstein's attorneys had already asked one of the victims, quote, now tell me about when the federal prosecutors told you about getting money. And so when the agreement was signed, shortly after the agreement was signed, Epstein's counsels indicated that Epstein may not comply with the agreement. And the agreement was appealed at various levels within the Justice Department. And she details in this affidavit, an affidavit that's also corroborated by the FBI case agent, how she and he and the office was concerned that Epstein might not comply. And we would have to go to trial. And we had to weigh the issue of how much to disclose against the issue of if we have to go to trial. We want to win. We want to put Epstein away. And talking about this would allow him to make the argument at trial that their testimony was compromised. And so when she was finally, when it was finally clear that Epstein would comply with the agreement, she talks about how she made efforts to notify the victims. How that was a Friday afternoon at 415 and that she learned that the state had scheduled the plea for 8.30 the following Monday. And she talks about how over the weekend she made every effort to notify the victims at that time. But the why the judge rule violated the rights? The judge rule violated the rights. Sir. Earlier you described the agreement So again, I would refer you to the documents I've provided. There is a big gulf between sufficient evidence to go to trial and sufficient evidence to be confident in the outcome of that trial. Right, and so, so if, if I could, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a follow-up in a minute. 
but if I could. And so when this case, and, and I provided a letter that outlined some of the timeline of this. In July of 2007, the career staff from my office met and they said, these are the four points that you will have to do in state court. And if not, we will proceed federally. They were very serious that they would proceed federally. That does not mean that they were confident in the final outcome. And one of the tough questions in these cases, what is the value of a secured guilty plea with registration versus rolling the dice? And I know that in 2019, looking back on 2008, things may look different. But this was the judgment of prosecutors with dozens of years of experience. If you look through that letter, you'll see this was not a single person making those decisions. If you wanted to follow up. I, I, I do not think that the office violated the ABA standards by negotiating strongly and forcefully. So, so standing here today, are you basically Mike? saying that you feel that you did everything you could, you got the best deal you could get, and you have no regrets? We believe that we proceeded appropriately. That based on the evidence, and not just my opinion, but I've shared the affidavit, based on the evidence, there was value to getting a guilty plea and having him register. Look, no regrets is a very hard question. At my confirmation hearing, I was asked a similar question. And one of the, one of the issues that I raised is we expect a lot more transparency today. As you watch these victim interviews, it's very obvious that the victims feel that this was not a sufficient outcome. These victims were traumatized. We can't begin to understand what they went through. And they look at this and they say, but why? And so you always look back and you say, what if? What I can say is, at the time, and I've provided a timeline, I've provided information about the individuals involved. This was the view of the office. There is a value to a sure guilty plea because letting him walk, letting what the state attorney was ready to do go forward would have been absolutely awful. Ben. Ben. Yes, Ben Penn from Bloomberg Law. Um, you know, in light of the uh, attention this week on on uh, your handling of, uh, it's back in 2008, victims of uh, sex trafficking, I wanted to ask about your role today as a lab Secretary of Labor. You have oversight through the Wage and Hour Division of uh, certifying visas for victims of uh, human trafficking, including sex trafficking. And uh, just last week, your uh, Wage and Hour Division issued a new policy that would uh, essentially allow the agency, uh, it's being criticized by a lot of people I've talked to, for allowing the agency to completely remove itself or to virtually remove itself from um, continuing to certify these visas by referring them to other agencies. How can you uh, so, defend, what was the purpose of that? So, so that, that is, if, if you read the policy, that is not what it does. Our wage and hour administrator, after she was confirmed, came in and she reviewed the policies. And she put in place a requirement that a criminal prosecutor be consulted any time one of these issues is brought to the division's attention. And that seems very reasonable. Don't we want criminal prosecutors to be consulted whenever someone says that they are a victim of trafficking? And that prosecutor will be consulted. And even if that prosecutor says this is not a case that we are going forward with, 
the division will still consider whether to issue that visa on the facts. So that is a mischaracterization of her decision and her policy. Could you go into a bit more detail about where and how uh, you exactly negotiated this deal? Did you meet with Epstein's attorney alone at a Marriott Hotel? So, you know, I've read this, and one of the things I find interesting is how, uh, how facts become facts because they're in a newspaper as opposed to the record. Um, I pulled up, I, I found out the details of that meeting because I scratched my own head about it, and I provided you a timeline in a letter of the negotiations that make it very clear that this was negotiated by career prosecutors. The, I'm, I'm going to answer your question. The meeting that was alleged was a breakfast meeting that took place after the agreement was negotiated, not before. The agreement was signed in September. After the agreement was negotiated, one of Epstein's attorneys asked for a meeting, asked for a hearing. I was giving a speech. I was staying at a hotel. I agreed to have a brief meeting, I believe, at 7 a.m. Rather than open the office, I spoke with that attorney. And then I referred that attorney to the career prosecutors. Nothing changed in that agreement. They continued to litigate the matter. They continued to appeal the matter to Washington. And nothing changed with one, one exception. There was an addendum that made clear that Epstein had to pay for any attorney that a victim that represented a victim in the cases against Epstein. And so, yes, I met with opposing counsel. It was a breakfast meeting because I was staying at the hotel. It was after, after, not before, and not part of the negotiations, but it was after the agreement had been negotiated. And that could be confirmed simply by looking at the date on the agreement and the date on the meeting. <laughs> so, Number one, the agreement had already been locked in place, so the agreement wasn't going to change. Before that agreement, you know, I was very careful to not negotiate this. Our career attorneys negotiated the agreement. Secondly, I'd point out, we live in a city where people have breakfast meetings all the time. You don't open an office at 7 o'clock in the morning just to have a meeting. You have it over breakfast. Yeah. Let me let, let me let me do this. I I, I had I had called Ian. I'll come back to you. I'll come back to you. Don't the young girls. I, I, I wanted to give Ian an opportunity. I'll come back to you in a minute. Thank you, sir. Um, you've mentioned several times that you and the prosecutors in your office weren't sure that you could secure a win in this case. But the very purpose of the of the CVRA is to give the victims an opportunity to weigh in. And a federal judge ruled that you broke federal law by not doing so. Do you think that your thinking would have been different had you followed the law and consulted the victims? So um, first, let me, let me point out, we followed department policy. Department policy at the time made very clear, and this is in a written statement that was subsequently issued by what is called the Office of Legal Counsel, which is the chief policy making, the chief legal arm of the Department of Justice, that these situations with non-prosecution agreements are not covered by the CVRA at the time because the CVRA, according to department policy, does not attach until a case is actually brought. Now, I understand that the judge had a different view, and I understand that the judge's view was that department policy did not comply with the law. And that's the way our system works. Our system works in that a judge can say what the department policy is is not consistent with the law. Now, let me also point out, since then, a few years ago, Congress amended the CVRA, and Congress amended it explicitly to say that non-prosecution agreements would be, in fact, covered. And that is a good thing. I, as I said at my confirmation hearing, you know, we expect a lot more transparency. If we had had more transparency, perhaps this case would have gone differently. I've laid out the reasons why there were concerns about providing all the details to the victims before Epstein pled. Um, but 
the Department of Justice has been very clear throughout multiple presidential administrations, throughout multiple attorneys general, that the department's position is that there was no violation of the law. <laughs> yes, I, Would you make I'm, I'm the sorry, same, your name and, and who you're with? I'm Caitlin Collins for CNN. Yeah. Would you make this same agreement today? So these questions are always very difficult because we now have 12 years of knowledge and hindsight, and we live in a very different world. Today's world treats victims very, very differently. Today's world does not allow some of the victim shaming that could have taken place at trial 12 years ago. Today's world understands that when interviewing victims, when eliciting testimony, that testimony can be sometimes contradictory, that memories are difficult. And so I don't think we can say, you know, take a case that is this old and fully know how it would play out today. But these victims say you failed them. I, I understand what the victims say, and I'm not here to try to say that I can stand in their shoes or that I can address their concerns. I'm here to say we did what we did because we wanted to see Epstein go to jail. He needed to go to jail. But he was out of jail before he needed, he he needed, about this he needed to go to jail. And that was that was the focus. John Funk. John? 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 Yes. Hi, Peter Alexander from NBC. Yeah. To be clear, dozens of girls were allegedly molested. Why didn't you just keep investigating and not follow up leads? So, the victims of which we were aware were part of this, and, and under the agreement in the Southern District of Florida, the investigation ceased and they had the opportunity to proceed civilly. That does not mean that the investigation had to cease nationwide. And as we see today, as we saw in New York, investigations could certainly and obviously have proceeded in other districts. And the follow up, how can you be trusted to enforce human trafficking laws as Secretary of Labor given your history with this case? So I have been, I started one of the first human trafficking task forces at the Department of Justice. I have been aggressive prosecuting human trafficking. We stood, we stepped in in this case, and we stopped a bad state plea. And so I understand from today's perspective that people scratch their heads and they say, why? Here's the question to ask. How many other times have you seen a US Attorney's Office intervene in a state matter and say, Stop the state plea because it is insufficient. Yes. Reuters, I want to ask you a question about the Office of Professional Responsibility. Um, earlier this year, it was disclosed that they're going that they're doing a review into how you and other prosecutors mm -hmm. in your office handled this matter. What is the status of that? What exactly are they looking at? Will you submit to an interview, even though you're no longer with the Justice Department? And if they find any misconduct, will you resign? Um, First, I don't know what the status of that is. Um, I would refer that to the Office of Professional Responsibility. I don't speak for them. Um, I will clearly submit for an interview even though I don't have to. Um, I think what they do is important. The Office of Professional Responsibility will have access to the full record. They will have access to all the facts. They will have access to the FBI reports. They'll have access to the victim interviews. They can look at this matter in its totality. Um, and, and so I think it is important that they proceed. I will gladly be part of it. And, and I think what they will find is that the office acted appropriately. Ma'am. Secretary. Hi, Secretary. Secretary Eric Costa, it's Yamik Shalsender with PBS NewsHour. As Labor Secretary, you tried repeatedly to cut a program that deals with, with human trafficking in the Labor Department by up to 80%, going before Congress advocating for that. Why should people trust you to focus on human trafficking and protect victims if you've done that? And I'd like a follow-up question. Um, so you're referring to grants that go to foreign countries 
um, for foreign country uh, labor related work. As part of the budget every year, those grants have been removed, as have other grants for foreign countries. And let me just add, as part of the budget every year, those grants are put right back in by Congress. Uh, this is what happens in Washington, and I fully suspect that those grants will remain in this year, the follow-up. Um, my follow-up question is, sources have told me that the President encouraged you to hold this press conference. Can you speak a little bit about what the President told you ahead of this press conference, and whether you're, you're here to give a message to the President, are you fighting for your job, or are, are you trying to send a message to victims, and if so, what is the message to victims who say they don't trust you anymore? So, uh, first, I'm not about to talk about conversations with the President, and I'm not here to send any signal to the President. I think it's important. A lot of questions were raised, and I, this has reached the point that I think it's important to have a public hearing. I think it's important that these questions be asked and answered. And, and as to a message to the victims, um, the message is you need to come forward. I heard this morning that another victim came forward and made horrendous, horrendous allegations. Allegations that should never happen to any woman, much less a young girl. And as victims come forward, these cases can be brought. And they can be brought by the federal government, they can be brought by state attorneys, and they will be brought. We have seen in the last few years cases brought against individuals that got away with things for well over a decade. And you know, it's, it's important to realize that people were getting away with these. People were not going to jail at all. And we're aware of those high profile cases. And we've seen as victims come forward how the justice system deals with them. And so the message to victims is come forward. Final Sir. Final Secretary. Secretary. Let, let, let me take a few more. Hi, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Richard Madden, CTV. You just said victims need to come forward. I'm sorry, Richard? Madden with CTV Television. Yeah. Uh, you just said a moment ago the victims should come forward, but you still haven't offered an apology to them. Why is that? So the victims should come forward because the justice system needs to hear from them. And what the victims went through is horrific. What the victims continue to go through is horrific. I've seen these videos. I've seen the interviews. I, I'm sorry. I've seen the interviews on, on television of these victims and, and their stories. And, and so it's hard. But I also think it's important that we understand that the men and women of my office, going back to 2006 and 2007 and 2008, have spent their career prosecuting these types of cases. And in their heart, in our heart, we were trying to do the right thing for these victims. And so this is horrific. This is awful. Um, each one of these cases is just devastating and saddening. Um, but I also think it's important to realize that the prosecutors were trying to do the right thing. Yeah, Sir. Thank you yeah, Jeff Earl from Daily Mail. How are you? Um, are you aware of alleged obstruction of justice by Mr. Epstein? Uh, it seemed to have been mentioned in a, in, a, in, a note, in a bail memo by New York prosecutors. And did he take efforts to, to intimidate prosecutors? And if he did, or harass witnesses, tamper witnesses, if he did that, why would he get what's been, viewed, what's been called a sweetheart deal? I, 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 can't, I can't comment on the New York case. That, that, that would not be appropriate. But were you aware Sir. of that in Florida? I'm talking about in Florida. Did he obstruct justice? Sir, there, there, there is a pending New York case in, in New York. I can't comment. Sir. I, I'm curious, who at Maine Justice, at Neil McCabe, One American News, who at Maine Justice reviewed this case or your decision, and did you have any interaction with Robert Mueller at the time? Um, so I, I shared a letter that I wrote to one of Epstein's defense attorneys. And I shared that letter in part because it shows much of the timeline. It shows how initially um, the, the meetings that took place were between the, uh, in July, between the first assistant, the criminal chief, the Palm, Beach, the Palm Beach office chief, and the line attorney and two FBI agents with Epstein's attorneys. You'll notice that the initial meeting as outlined in this letter, who are all career attorneys, how they presented the terms, how Epstein's attorneys were dissatisfied and asked for a meeting with me, how I subsequently went with their attorneys, along with all the career officials, how at that meeting we then invited the chief of the child exploitation and obscenity section from the Department of Justice to travel down, 
because one of the, you know, one of the things we wanted to make sure of was that we had, going back to the earlier question about the ADA rule, that we had sufficient evidence to proceed ethically. Um, and then it details a little bit on how Epstein's counsels appealed the decisions to Washington. I'd refer you to the record. You know, one of the really disturbing things about this case is there's a record here. The documents that I shared today, we've shared previously with media, yet I've seen no reference to any of these documents in the perspective of some of these prosecutors. There's a record. All these documents are publicly available and could have been pulled up by anyone in this room. And so, and, and, and so you know, there, there is a record that will, you know, I wasn't at Maine Justice. I do not have a full list of the individuals that, that reviewed this matter at Maine Justice. I can tell you um, the individuals referenced in this letter. Um, and, and I would refer you to the record because I, this was 12 years ago. I do not have a full list of the individuals that but reviewed this at Maine Justice. Well, the, as, as the record makes clear, individuals from Maine Justice were involved uh, fairly early on and were certainly aware of it. And, and I think if you look at the record, it will become clear that our decisions were appealed again and again to, to Maine Justice. Thank Sir. Thank you, Mr. Um, Adam Schuber from the Financial Times. Um, so the deal that you negotiated uh, resulted in two things. One is that the case ended with Mr. Epstein pleading to state prostitution charges and another thing that it did was that it immunized his co-conspirators. So two questions. Did you consider his victims in that case to be prostitutes? And why did you immunize his co-conspirators? Um, so the answer to were the victims prostitutes? No. Victims, they were victims. End of story. They were victims. Um, the second part of that is in the purpose in this case was to bring Epstein to jail, to put him behind bars. And so there were other individuals that may have been involved that um, in any type of conspiracy, there are individuals around someone. Um, the focus really is on the top player, and that's where our focus appropriately was. Let me, um, let me also say something, because a lot has been said about this 13 month. Um, when we proceeded, the expectation was that it would be an 18 month sentence. And the expectation was that it would be served in jail. And so this work release was complete BS. And I've been on record as far back as 2011 saying that it was not what was bargained for and it was not what we expected. But this was a state court plea. And because it was a state court plea, the terms of confinement were under the jurisdiction of the state of Florida. And so the outrage over that 13 month, you know, getting to, to leave jail is entirely appropriate. When we entered into this, we, I at least, fully thought that he would be spending the time in jail. That's what we mean by someone going to jail. Sorry, if I can get a brief statement in Spanish. I would really appreciate it. Um, I'll tell you what, if you answer the, you want, if, if you ask me a question in Spanish, I will answer in Spanish. Is that fair? Well, I was trying to get a brief statement, I mean, so that I could go over with what everyone already said. En, déjame, en un, un minuto. Nuestros fiscales en este asunto querían que este señor fuera a la cárcel. Era increíble importante que él fuera a la cárcel porque eso es donde él tenía que estar. Y poner todas las otras personas en el país en, 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 no, en, en, en notice que él era un hombre muy malo, que él era un predator sexual. Y por eso es que hicimos este asunto. ¿Debería usted disculparse con ellos, con las víctimas? ¿Perdón? ¿Debería usted disculparse con las víctimas? Muchos de los colegas han hecho esa pregunta. Las víctimas han sufrido mucho en este asunto. Y yo he mirado algunos de los, eh, de los interviews, de los, eh, ayúdame, de interviews, de, de las entrevistas. Y eh, es un asunto muy, muy difícil. Pero a la misma vez, nuestros fiscales trataron de hacer lo que podían con 
lo que tenían en este caso. Did, did, did you ask a question already? I did. Okay, let, 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 me, let me go to someone. someone. Yeah. Uh, you said earlier that your message to victims was to come forward. What's your message specifically to those who did come forward and felt let down by you? Um, they came, look, victims came forward and, and there were several victims. You know, I, I believe that in one of the filings, the Department of Justice um, talked to several of the victims. And some of the victims just didn't want any, any public notoriety. Um, other victims have provided interviews and said they felt let down, that they were let down. Um, these are really hard cases. The prosecutors in my office and I were focused on putting him in jail. I provided the information from the career attorney as to why there were concerns. If we went to trial and it became clear that they were going to receive money if he was convicted, how that would impeach their credibility. And, and today, that would proceed very differently because victim shaming is, is just not accepted. But the circumstances of trials and what juries would consider 12 years ago was different. And so these were the judgments that were made. I understand that, that individuals will look at these judgments and say, well, maybe a different judgment should have been made. You know, you can always look at a play after the fact and say, should it have been the safe play or should you have gone for the big score? And ask, which is the right outcome? But I provided these documents so that you could hear from the prosecutors themselves how these doc how this was being weighed. Sir. Uh, Justice Bagman, Vice News. Did the Miami Herald reach out to you last November? And if so, why didn't you set the record straight on the breakfast meeting then? Um, so media has reached out to me over the years about this. I, I think it's very important. The Department of Justice is the entity that is litigating all these matters. And quite honestly, until, until recently, I haven't commented on this since 2011 because I think it's important for the United States to litigate cases through the Department of Justice. And if former U.S. attorneys responded to media inquiries about pending cases, and this is a pending case, there was a live and there still is a live civil matter. If former U.S. attorneys responded to media inquiries all the time we'd have havoc in our justice system. You can't have a Department of Justice as a litigating entity with U.S. attorneys giving press statements. Now, your follow-up question may be, why am I talking today? And the answer is this has clearly reached the level where I thought it was important to have this kind of press conference to take questions um, and, and, and to, to provide these facts and these perspectives. And I understand that individuals may say this was not enough. Um, but this is the way it was viewed, not only by me, but by many back in 2008. Secretary, can I ask one more question? Sir. Yes, uh, Doug Ritchie from uh, Talk Media News. Yes. One thing, yes. Um, you said that the victims were not prostitutes, but the agreement was he was jailed for prostitution charges, not for, child, for, for sex trafficking. Can you just uh, say the, what the, the distinction the was? Agreement, the agreement was, this was a state, here's, here's why, why this is hard. This was a state case. He was arraigned, he, a state grand jury returned a prostitution charge against him, a solicitation charge if I recall. That was a state grand jury. He was allowed to self-surrender by the state attorney's office as a result of that single charge that would have resulted in no jail time. And ultimately, what the agreement did was say, you have to go back and you have to plead to a more serious state charge that requires jail time, that requires registration, and under this agreement, you'll have a mechanism for restitution. But the agreement itself, you know, ultimately, the state of Florida and the state attorney's office in Florida is a separate sovereign. The U.S. attorney does not determine how those offices run themselves or what charges they bring. I do not consider the victims prostitutes. I, I think that is insulting to them. These were victims. They were not just women victims. They were children victims. Secretary, Secretary, 
since Mr. Epstein left jail, he's been a public figure. He's been a man about town. He hasn't seemed particularly contrite about what he did. What have you thought when you've seen him? You know, what I've thought is I keep reading newspaper articles about pending investigations here or there. You know, if, uh, if someone does a Google search, they'll see that there were rumors of investigations going on for the last 10 years. And uh, New York finally stood up and stood up and they took one of those investigations and they brought charges and in all candor, I wish it would have happened. Um, I'm, I'm glad to see that it's happening now. Um, he's a, you know, he's a bad man and, and he needs to be put away. And, um, you know, based on additional allegations that I saw this morning, um, there, there are multiple jurisdictions, whether federal or state, that, that he's going to have to answer to. A, a, few, a, few, a, few more, a few more questions. Yes. Uh, Alex Dockery with the Miami Herald. I wanted to ask and follow up with your answer to the earlier question about the potential co-conspirators. Were you confident at the time that any potential additional co-conspirators didn't commit uh, sexual abuses against underage girls like Epstein did, even if it may not have been at the same scale? Because some of those victims have accused others of doing similar acts to them. So um, let me see how I can address your question without running afoul of Department of Justice guidelines. Um, if my office had been aware of individuals who committed acts such as, as a sexual abuse, you know, my office, it would not have been my position that those individuals should have been part of, of that kind of, of, of immunity. It's not even an immunity deal. Should not have been part of that paragraph. And so, so I know that there are a lot of rumors about who those individuals may or may not be. Um, I think those rumors uh, are misconstruing the acts of the office with respect to that particular paragraph. One more question. Uh, Richard Lardner from the Associated Press. Mr. Secretary, were you ever made aware at any point in your handling of this case, if Mr. Epstein was an intelligence asset of some sort? Um, so, effect, so, so, so there, has, there has been reporting to that effect. And, and let me say, um, there's been reporting to a lot of effects in, in, in this case, uh, not just now, but over the years. And, and again, I would, you know, I would hesitate to take this reporting as fact. Um, this was a case that was brought by our office. It was brought based on the facts. And, and I look at that reporting and others. I, I can't address it directly because of our, uh, our, our guidelines. Um, but I can tell you that, that a lot of reporting is just going down rabbit holes. A, 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 few, a, few, a few more questions. A few more questions. Have you asked a question yet? OK, um, how, how about then in front of you? Yes. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to do a one question per person. Talk about the powerful people who okay. are yeah. Can I go ahead? Yeah. Hi, uh, Katie Rogers with the New York Times. I'm just yeah. wondering what makes you so confident that the president is going to continue to have you serve? There have been several advisors of his who he stands, he stands up for initially, but you're about at the level where he has backed away before. So what makes you so confident? So, um, <laughs> look, I, I am here to talk about this case. I'm doing my job. If at some point the president decides that I am not the best person to do this job. I respect that. That is his choice. I serve at the pleasure of the president. Um, I thought yesterday he was kind and, and he showed great support. Um, but we have to remember we are here because we are part of an administration that is creating jobs, that is creating growth, that is really transforming our economy and focusing it on, you know, the, the forgotten man and woman. And if at some point he says, look, you know, you're not the right person for this right now or, or you know, you're standing in the way, I, I respect that. Can I yes. um, do you really have nothing else to say to these victims beyond you should come forward? That places a lot of burden on children. Um, so, what else do you have to say? You've avoided addressing these, these people directly. Why so, is that? So, so to be clear, that is not all I say. You know, I think, if I recall, and I obviously don't have a transcript here, but you know what I've said previously is, look, I have seen these interviews, and I can't, I generally be, can't begin to fathom what these victims have been through. I don't think that anyone that has not been in this situation can begin to fathom. The closest I can come is to think, what would 
I feel like if one of my girls was going through this, and, and I would be, and I'm not sure I can say the way I would feel on, on television, um, but, but even that is different than what the victims themselves went through. And so the point I'm trying to make is everything that the victims have gone through in these cases is horrific, and, and their response is entirely justified. At the same time, I think it's important to stand up for the prosecutors of my former office and make clear that what they were trying to do was help these victims. They should not be portrayed as individuals that just didn't care because they have spent a lifetime of bringing cases like this. They are individuals who really, really do care. That's not an apology though, right? Nikki Schwab, New York Post. How much of this do you think was um, Epstein getting special treatment because of his enormous, enormous wealth and also political connection? So, you know, I've, I've heard a lot about that. And um, if you go through the record, you will see that in July, he was presented with certain terms. And, and I laid this out in a letter, an open letter that I wrote to address some of these questions in 2011. And he was presented with terms. And the office throughout this entire negotiation, and it took several months from July to, what, December, through these five months of negotiations, stuck to those terms. You go to jail, you register, and you provide restitution. The original term was two years. The office ultimately agreed to 18 months. Register, it had to be an offense, it had to be an offense where there was registration because the world needed to be on notice that he was a sexual predator. And it had to be a situation where the victims could seek restitution because it wasn't just enough for him to go to jail. And let me also say, you know, I, restitution is also not enough. You can never put victims in the place they were before they were victimized. You can't unwind history but restitution is important. Thank you very much. You mentioned his legal team. You mentioned his legal team, how powerful his lawyers were, that they put pressure on you, that they put pressure on DC. Did someone at DOJ tell you or order you to cut a deal with Jeffrey Epstein? His, his attorneys um, certainly uh, filed several appeals with Maine Justice. I will again restate. When the career attorneys met with him, they presented certain terms. And the office stayed true to those terms throughout. Those terms did not change. The agreement did not change. No level of appeal to main justice changed the terms of these initial points in those agreements. One, one last, one last, one last, one, one last right, right, right there. Yes, ma'am. I just have a question for you. And the proposed remedies from Jane Doe and one and two, one of their requests is to, can they just meet with you? I know you're not apologizing today, but would you be willing to meet with them? You know, that's a really, that, that's a really good question. Um, this is currently in litigation, and so I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to interfere with that litigation, but let me just say, um, I have monitored this litigation without, you know, I haven't monitored day to day. I have never pulled the full record, but I have watched it. And I have seen what these victims have gone through. And, and whenever this litigation is concluded, um, I've always had an open door policy and I've always welcomed the opportunity to sit down. And I think it'd be really healthy for prosecutors to sometimes circle back and, and really hear about what happened. Because we all have to learn. You know, one of, the, one of the questions that came up at my confirmation hearing was what would you do differently? And I alluded to this. And I said, the world is much more transparent. We expect a lot more from government. We are a less trusting society. We can wonder whether that's right or wrong, but we are a less trusting society today. In part because our culture expects transparency. And so to sit down and hear from victims how this impacted them I think would be healthy for prosecutors generally. I can't commit in this particular case, it's in litigation. 
but I think that would be healthy for prosecutors generally. So the Thank you very much.